name is Stuart Hamilton, and I was delighted when Lorna asked me to come and say a few words about playing for Lois Marshall. Um, for the last 10 years of her career, I had the enormous privilege of playing for her recitals. And it's hard to describe what was so special about Lois, but for me, it was the fact that she loved music and loved singing and loved sharing her music with the audience. And the audience got that from the minute she stepped onto the stage, always. I had a lot of fun with Lois. I mean, she, was, she had a tremendous sense of humor. She wrote, she would, as we were touring across the country, she would come up with limericks that would curl your hair. They were so terrible. <laughs> and I wouldn't begin to, to tell you some of the limericks in this polite society. But we had a great time being naughty on the tour with that kind of thing. Um, she was, she had a, a great desire always to be warmed up. She had a very, very big voice. It was a great big uh, dramatic soprano for most of the time that I played her, and then, then she became a mezzo in the last few years of her, her singing career. I remember one time, the last time she sang the Messiah at the um, Massey Hall, she phoned me up and said, please come down and help me warm up before the Messiah. So I said, of course. And I brought my score of the Messiah and I put it on the piano. She said, oh, I don't want to sing that. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, oh, let's do Tosca. I said, Tosca? You know, this is Handel, this is not Puccini. And she said, oh, but uh, Tosca warms my voice up beautifully. Well, so we went through the first act of Tosca, me singing Cavaradossi and Scarpia. You can imagine what that sounded like. <clears throat> At any rate, she sang it beautifully. It was like she was singing at the Metropolitan Opera or something. So when she finished, I said, well, uh, now do you want to do, I know that my reading Malibeth or something. She said, are you kidding? I hate that piece. <laughs> and I said, Lois, I, you know, the New York Times said that you're singing and I know that my Redeemer Malibeth would be enough to turn anybody into a Christian. So. <laughs> I mean, you're famous for this piece. She said, I just hate it. I've always hated singing it. It's in the wrong part of my voice. It just kills me. I'm always relieved when it's over. Well, so much for her spiritual performance of, of the, the piece. Um, another time, she, was, she asked me when I got opera in concert going, she said, I want to do one of those. And I said, well, of course, I would be delighted, Lois. We can't afford your fee. Oh, I don't care about the fee. That wasn't true. She wanted the fee eventually, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, we broke the bank and had her do, I had, she asked me to choose a piece for her, so I chose a two-act opera by Massenet called Therese, and I, it's a story about the French Revolution, about a, a girl who, who marries a, a revolutionary, and then he is in turn executed by the revolution, and she joins him at the scaffold at the end. A very dramatic final scene where she declaims rather than sings. And um, I remember I had friends from the theater in New York who came up to see the show, and they said, you know, when Lois came out, she was dressed, Lois didn't have terrific taste as far as clothes were concerned, and she was dressed in a horrible uh, yellow, um, flowered chiffon costume with a tiara and everything it was just hideous. And I said, Lois, you can't, this girl is supposed to be a member of the, the lower classes, so you can't wear a tiara. That doesn't, oh, but I promise, no, no, you take that tiara off. So she took it with high resignation. She took off the tiara and she went out and my friends from New York said, when she came out, we thought, they thought, oh my God, what is this? This is, this is supposed to be a big glamorous opera star and Lois was not a glamorous person. However, when she started to sing, and she did this final scene, declaiming the text rather than singing it, my friends, who are very, very uh, snobby, if you will, theater people, <laughs> said they have never had a theatrical experience like Lois delivered that night. It was absolutely thrilling. And I remember as we were standing on the wings to go out to do the show, uh, the first thing that she had was with the baritone, the Canadian baritone, Peter Bartza. And 
Peter said to me, as just as we were going out, he says, Stuart, don't play so loud all the time. <laughs> and Lois said, oh yes, play loud. I mean, loud, loud. I like lots of support. Well, Peter was at the beginning of his very distinguished career, but he was just at the beginning. Lois was a big star, so do the math. <laughs> I played really loud. Another time we were doing a recital in this hall. It was a very demanding program where she sang the Frauen Liebenleben of Schumann and the Dichterliebe of Schumann and a huge uh, group of Mahler songs from the Knaben Wunderhorn. So she said, please come down and, and let's warm up a bit. Come down at about five o'clock, the recital was at eight. So I came down and, and I said, what would you like to do? Oh, let's just start at the beginning. She said, so we're, chang, chang, cha da di, sai di jin ge zin, lao bi jin su lao. So she went through the thing with all the emotion and everything, it was all good. And I kept saying, well, that's lovely, Lois, you're in good form. So, no, 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 keep going, keep going. So we went through the whole program. And then she said, okay, let's do Tosca now. <laughs> And I said, Lois, it's 25 after 7. They are, they show, they're opening the theater in about five minutes, and the, the show is at 8 o'clock, and I'm starving. I have to have something to eat. Really? <laughs> I said, yes, I have to eat something. I, I can't do this big, demanding program without something in my stomach. Oh, are you sure? <laughs> I said, yes, I'm going up to Murray's up here on Bloor Street. It was a, a chain of rather inexpensive, not to say cheap, restaurants called Murray's. And I went up to Murray and got a hamburger and ran back and shoved it in. And we went through the program and Lois was in fabulous voice. It was a terribly exciting evening and the place was full. And we did three or four encores and that was all we had rehearsed. So the audience was still cheering away and Lois said, oh, do you know Hark the Echoing Air of Purcell? And I said, yes. And she said, well, let's do that. And I said, but we don't have the music, dear. And I said, I don't play from memory. I'm an accompanist, not a solo pianist. And she said, oh, well, I have the music right here. So she got the music and I said, let's go and do it. So on the way out, just coming out that door, I said, Lois, what's your tempo for this? She said, never mind, just play it as fast as you can. <laughs> the thing was that I think that was a comment on the fact that I didn't play fast. I was, I was very sensitive and interesting pianist. But I, I was not terrific as a fast pianist. However, what Lois didn't know was that I had played Hark the Echoing Air about 5,000 times, and I knew it inside out. So I went, dum 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 well, it was, we just went through it like zooming, and at the end of it, she threw back her head and roared with laughter, and the audience screamed. It was such a fun. Well, our darling Mary Morrison was in the audience that night, and Mary's an old friend of mine, and she came back and she whacked me across the thing and said, how dare you play that person that fast? I said, what am I supposed to do? She said, play it as fast as I can. Lois told, told me afterwards she never heard the piece played that fast. And she didn't believe that my fingers, my tired little fingers, would go that fast. So we had a number of interesting experiences like that. Everybody has a favorite uh, moment in their career. And my favorite moments were always those was when I was playing for Lois Marshall. Thank you very much.